All right, it's so happy to be here. Um, my name is Bridget Pfeiffer, Executive Director of Parkside Business and Community and Partnership. We're a locally based community development corporation in the Parkside community of Camden. Um, and just before I jump in, just want to give you a little backstory of who the organization is. It was established in 1993 um, by a group of residents, 200 of them as a matter of fact, who came together, were fed up with open air drug dealing, decided that they needed to create a plan and you know, uh, created this organization. Um, they work basically as volunteer-based organization for about seven or eight years, brought me on board, told me to get a housing program off the ground and running. I knew nothing about a housing program. Um, but what I did know was at that time that the greatest asset that we had in that community were the people who lived there. Despite the fact that it's a very historic neighborhood that overlooks the river, that has these phenomenal institutions like Lord's Medical Center, Coop Campbell Soup in our backyard, Camden County Historical Society, that meant nothing without the people. Um, so in 2005, we engaged in a neighborhood planning process. 2015, I looked back on it and thought, huh, we've gotten some things accomplished, 250 housing units. Um, 90 of which were for sale, which really is our interest. We want people to have a vested interest, so we want to sell homes in Parkside to low, moderate, and emerging market families. Um, we had also been able to, um, you know, provide uh, laundromat services. We've been able to stabilize businesses. We had restored a park. We had restored um, an athletic field for our high school. We've been able to do some great things, but still the community had not transformed. It had had not changed in the way that we envisioned it in 2005. So the idea from the community um, that I supported was that we needed to take another look. We needed to try it again. And this time, to be able to engage um, additional stakeholders and experts and partners um, in the process. So um, we were able to get funding through Wells Fargo Regional Foundation for the neighborhood planning process, completed it in 2018. But the important part is that we were able to engage over 700 residents, stakeholders, to talk about the future of their communities and to talk about how they were affected by living in that community, to talk about social capital, to talk about entrepreneurship, to talk about really what they believed was important for that community's future. Um, and so in addition to those stakeholders, we engaged city, our city officials, we engaged our county freeholders, we engaged um, as many experts in the process as we possibly could. Um, so through that, we were able to identify um, varied means um, in terms of engagement. Uh, because we are a community of, that's about 30% um, youth, 18 and under, and because at the other end of the spectrum, there's about 15% of the population that are 65 and older, we knew for engagement that we had to have multiple layers of outreach. So social media, we talk about it all the time, how important it is, but I think that's more important for the millennials, for the Zers. Um, and so how do we engage those folks that may not necessarily have access to Facebook or they're not interested in Instagram or Snapchat? Um, and so we stay true to who we are. We host monthly community meetings, very thematic. Our meetings cent are centric to various issues that the community has indicated that they want to hear about. Also, um, once a year, we present a very kind of authentic plan to the community that we call the Parkside State of the Community, where we talk about projects that will be happening that year. We talk about the money. This is the money that we have. This is where we're going. Um, and so, you know, but very centric topics, women's health, men's health. Um, we bring in the mayor and his entire department heads because there are questions very often that the community have about potholes, about aborted up property, you know, about why is my trash not being picked up twice a week when that's what you guys have indicated should be happening. So, you know, very often they refer to us as Little City Hall because we have been able to really kind of create an 
authentic space um, in the community. But I want those who should be held accountable to be held accountable for what they are and in some instances not doing. So we invite them into those meetings. Um, we are going through a reconstruction of a high school, a 100-year-old high school, Camden High, which was a hot, 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 ooh, hot mess. There you go. Triple hot mess. That's what was said. I didn't say it, but she said it, but it is true. And so, you know, um, we believed it was important. We weren't a part of that decision making. We were told, just like all of the other residents of Camden, that that school was coming down. And so there was a lot of pushback from the community. But there were other people in the community who supported it. And so very often we would be asked, where do we stand? And I said, I stand with the community. Because there are different opinions, views, people come from different places in terms of how they view that, I support the community. And very often I was in hot water over that, but that's the reality of it. We can't speak for ourselves. We, I can't speak as Bridget. I can't speak, you know, as PBCIP about a community that's actually um, confined with the greatest asset, the people. Um, and so through the neighborhood planning process, we use social media. We also knocked on doors. I, we believe in the old school, you know, actually having relationships with people who live there. You know, not that surface. Um, I know Miss Betty lives somewhere. Um, no, we can go knock on the doors and Miss Betty will come and say, oh my gosh, Bridget, I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, we also um, use small, very focused meetings to have very detailed conversations about development in terms of housing. We have a 50% vacancy rate along our commercial corridor, so very microscopic kind of questions to our business leaders about what they wanted to see along Haddon Avenue. Um, in terms of education, talking to folks about how can we monitor and be the watchdog of what's happening at Camden High. And then the other side of it was what can we do to improve the educational system um, in this community? Because all of you would agree the greatest economic development any uh, community has, the greatest economic development engine, are the schools. If those schools are doing well, then that community is doing well. And so how is it that we could better the schools and who are the partners that we could bring to the table to help us achieve that goal? Um, so through small meetings, um, engagement through our door-to-door -door knocking, our monthly community meetings. People know the last Wednesday of every month except for July and August. Uh, we are at the Camden County Historical Society talking about a topic that we have surveyed the community about that we know is important. May, we're going to be recognizing our young people for their achievements. Um, and so um, also just through uh, events that we sponsor, we have an annual street festival, through our national night out events, um, we have movie nights in the park, we have music in the garden. So even through those events, just making sure that we were talking to people about what they believed was important for their community. And so as a result, there are four buckets um, that were created, four core areas, one being development, the second being neighborhood services, which includes safety. Like, you know, we want to be in safe communities. And we've seen some, you know, drastic change in the community, but we still know that there are three drug sets, we know it, that are in that community. I make sure the police knows about it. And not part of it. <laughs> exactly. How, how about that? <laughs> how about that? So it is questionable how you know that a drug set exists and it's been there for years, but it's never been cleaned up. So there, there, there is something to be said about that. Um, and so the third being um, open space and active living. Because we have a 72-acre park um, that we were a part of uh, restoring through a $1.2 million pro uh, grant, um, you know, open space is important. We also have trails that overlook the river. So being able to provide, you know, that asset, that amenity to the community is really important for us. And we also have an urban agriculture program. 
we, you know, we've been investigating. I think we figured it out that the urban food economy, growing food in our community, can really help boast the economy of the people who live there. Um, so we're at the cutting edge right now, really trying to at the cusp of really figuring that out. So I'm excited about that. You have a question? Yeah. Um, how, if, you, if this is not the right time, how are you fine? How, is, how are y'all battling gentrification? Okay, so the question is, how are we battling gentrification? Um, so we're not at risk of it at this moment, but how we will battle it as we continue forging ahead is through making sure any development, housing development that occurs includes um, affordable units. Um, also, we want to make sure that, you know, we're not selling our properties at an astronomical, you know, kind of value. Yes, we want to be able to increase the value of the neighborhood because that certainly improves the financial kind of uh, wherewithal of the people who live there. But, you know, we want to just kind of modulate um, the wealth building in the community. Um, and so I think it's really important for us also to make sure for financial literacy. So the people who live there understand budgeting. They understand, you know, credit restoration. They understand credit. Um, and, you know, so we don't just want people who also are living in the community to just be renters. If, in fact, you have the dream or the goal of owning your own homes, we want to put you in position to do that. And right now we're educating about 120 to 150 families annually through our Hope Institute program, which does just that. Um, and so we're really excited about what's happening now at the state level where there's about $15 million that's been allocated for um, funding. Um, we're hoping that the budget gets approved where we can re-engage in housing development. Many of you know under Christie, all the funding was kind of siphoned. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, were, we weren't able to develop in the way that we had previously. But that, those are some of the tools that we'll be using. And then also empowering um, the residents to be able to create their own businesses. Uh, we are in the process. Next month, we'll be opening the Arts Pavilion. And so it's an 8,000 square foot building that will house some local nonprofit organizations that have never been able to find a place to call home. So we have a dance studio, we have a visual arts performing space, um, and we will also have a fashion design kind of center. Um, and so really excited about it. In addition to that, we've created co-work space for local arts-based organizations that aren't quite ready to take on space, but they may need a, a desk, they may need an office. And so we're providing that, we're subsidizing that um, for the arts um, organizations. And so that's one of those vacant buildings that make up that 50% vacancy rate along Haddon Avenue, which is a major commercial corridor. And so we see that as a tool also to kind of eliminate uh, gentrification. Very often gentrification happens because the people who are there don't have the economy. They don't have the economic base to continue to stay in their community. So being able to increase that I think really helps to position them and fight against that. Any other questions? <laughs> so we had such a great conversation. I was ready for you. No, no, oh. I'm territory. Folks don't understand the because uh, going back to my era of being down there, yeah. Campbell Soup was the backbone of Campbell. Right. Then Rutgers popped up and everything was all about Rutgers and everything else. The Eds and Meds. Mm-hmm. The Eds and Meds. Uh, Camden High School. I mean, uh, the high Camden school High. Got to be something else everybody was running for. Yeah. I was down in North Camden and then coming off of 130 to go to North Camden before you get to the Ben Franklin where it was a little elementary school there. It's all nice new police department and yeah. lots for cars. Yeah. Yeah. All this wonderful stuff in the other blocks look like all hell. Like, like Beirut. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, just again, resident engagement, um, I believe it's really important if, in fact, we're going to transform and kind of lift up our communities. It must happen from the bottom up. Very often in our communities, we see the exact opposite, where it's a top-down approach. I implore you to just engage and just really have authentic conversations. Um, and, you know, it's not always easy. I mean, there are going to be some tough questions that are going to be asked. And just re really positioning yourself to be truthful and honest about 
that white elephant in the community or that white elephant in the room. And at the end of the day, I think you're more respected for your work. And so the official colonizers not coming like Christopher Columbus dismissing the current residents. Right, absolutely. And so, you know, what we've decided, and another reason why we went through this neighborhood planning process is because we've been deemed the medical mile. So Cooper Hospital sits at one end, uh, Lord's Medical Center at another, we're in the middle. And so we really should be engaged and have a voice so that when the development happens, which is it's starting to happen, um, we're, we have a seat at the table and they're serving our interests, not theirs. Yeah, absolutely. Right, absolutely, yeah. So the social determinants of health around that whole conversation, yeah. Thank you.